So I wanted to talk a little bit about Brenda and she's you know, the, the Sheltie that, you know, she was sharing that she's been frustrated and we have to look at our own mental and emotional state as feedback to ourselves, right? So when we're frustrated, something is amiss and we can look externally and say, oh, it's because my dog is not progressing or because my dog is barking or because my dog, whatever the expression is, but we can treat ourselves in the same way that we are treating our dogs as looking, you know, like for what's coming right before the frustration um, and, and try to hone in on it that, you know, I mean, I find it can be very um, self enlightening to find the source of my frustration or anxiety that it's, um, you know, for instance, like, you know, my griping, I've been griping about courses like crazy and yeah, the courses have been awful. These like, squeezed in small space, like 60 by 80, circling back onto themselves that organizations are putting out so that people can run courses and get cues, um, which I kind of wonder why I'm doing because I don't care about cues and I haven't even sent some of them in. Um, but my level of griping is much more extreme than it would be if I were in a good mental state. So due to the COVID thing. So I think it really is important to, to acknowledge if we are in a funk and, um, you know, that to simplify, to get away from the external goals and to do something fun with our dogs and to give ourselves time and a break that even if we feel like we really want to get this done so that we can trial, blah, 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 might not be the best thing in the long run or the short run for you or your dog, right? because it's gonna get in the way. When we are frustrated, we're inner focused, we're focused on ourselves versus on our dogs. So, you know, think, think about that, that our emotional state is feedback to us about what um, we are communicating to our dogs and to ourselves. So it really goes back to that first conversation I had with my phone, <laughs> with you guys. It is weird talking to nobody. Yeah, you guys gotta try this sometime. Let's see. So the one other thing, um, Brenda was, she's in a course that is winding down um, on, I assume it's running contacts since she's doing box work. And w one thing to keep in mind is if you are training just one thing, like mat running, mat running, mat running, and a lot of the running contact starts with, you know, straight exits, that your dog may lose the balance between extension and collection. I know this was true with Dakota when I was doing a lot of Nina Gregel um, striding grids that, you know, to, to get them back into good condition for agility when after a few months early on in COVID, that he was just assuming straight lines everywhere. He was seeing straight lines everywhere because that's what he was doing. And he was running towards that part of the field where the grids had been. And he would take jumps over there just because that's where he had had so much fun. So if you're training a lot of um, you know, this box work, just know even driving down a plank to a box is forward. And you'll have to do other training to keep turns and collection in, um, in balance. So I would be mixing stuff in, even though this course, you kind of feel like you're under pressure maybe to you know, keep up and get it done. But I wouldn't do just sessions of that. I would, at the end of every session of that, I would do some, some turns over jumps. I would do some tight turns around barrels if you don't have a tunnel. I would just keep balancing so that, um, like I did that with Dakota after I realized it was causing a, a thinking that we're always going straight and we're always going big and bold, that all it took was finishing sessions with some wrap training to get things a little bit more in balance, so just a thought about anybody who is is on, in an online class training a specific skill is really think about you know what the dog is doing and make sure that you're you're balancing it if you care if you don't want to lose balance in other ways the other thing that um, Brenda brought up is that she doesn't have access to typical training environments for this young dog that she can't go to fun runs she can't go to trials and that's, that is real. I, mean, I was just out with um, my 17 month old, I'll call him cousin because I don't know what relation it is, but we're close, closely related. And the playground's just open around here. He hasn't been to a playground. And 
So he didn't run out and said, oh, there's a slide, oh, there's a climby thing. He was like looking at stuff going, what is this? And it was really interesting to see him and this other little boy came later, 18 months old. And they were just kind of like, like, what is this stuff? What do we do? And they were kind of hesitant about going down slides. Well, the same is, is true with these dogs that haven't had that normal access. So to trial environments or even just to class environments. So as hard as it might be that once things start opening up and you can take this dog to a class environment or to a fun run, definitely observe your dog. It is possible that your dog would be better served not going in the ring. Just like when we start off with puppies, our puppies don't go in the ring for 18 months and they're around that trial environment, you know, quite often in, you know, for those of us who trial a lot. So it's going to be hard to not go in because your dog has all the skills. But, um, you know, as soon as you can start getting them out and, and just doing some mark, a little bit of mark work, a single jump, whatever it is in that environment and start exposing them to those kind of distractions. Um, you know, I wouldn't rush straight from COVID nothingness to a trial and expect a dog, any dog to do well, let alone a dog that is, you know, already showing, you know, a bit of stress and anxiety. Now, I do know that, um, you know, Sharon Nelson, she puts weird stuff in her training barn, like she puts those um, foil balloons and weird, you know, she puts potato chips bags and crunchies them while the dogs are working and all sorts of stuff like that. I have not done that but it makes sense to me that that would be something worth doing, especially with a dog that is noise sensitive. Um, you know, like I would, even if, if you had a, the ability to do loudspeaker kind of noises, um, that can throw a lot of dogs off. So if there was a way for you to do that, or if there's a way for you to have, you know, a, like a training partner and that can, you know, have a dog in the corner on a leash or whatever, do what you can in the meantime, but you know, real, when the time comes that you can return to trialing and you want to start trialing this dog to really stay connected and um, ease your dog into it that, that in whatever way he needs, I think it will pay off in the long run. And um, it sucks, right? It sucks that we can't do all the things that we normally do. So I think, I think you know, it's kind of, Many of us are in the boat, like where Lil, I think she might have just been retired through COVID because it's going on and on and on. And I wouldn't have retired her had we continued to trial. And with Dakota, he's five, he's in his prime and we're not trialing because there weren't trials. So it sucks at a lot of different levels. But with these young dogs that haven't had the kind of exposure, they, I, you know, they, I think that we need to treat them like young dogs, regardless of how old they are, but when they go to the trial environment is new to them and to treat them just like we would a young puppy that is at its first trials because kind of the same thing. And really seeing my cousin, it, it drove home how um, this isolation is, is gonna affect young children and these dogs perhaps, I don't know. I, we'll have to see to be continued on that. So this is the other thing that came up today that when a dog is exhibiting a higher level of stress than what you think is um, healthy for the dog, I see a lot of dogs exhibit a high level of stress in a trial environment. And the reason it came up in my mind today is I was walking along a place called Blackie's Pasture and there was some lapping of some waves from the bay. And Dakota went into this higher stress state that is exactly like his sister is at trials or was at trials before Heather started, you know, working with her in a different way since doing Ocean. And it's great to see them because they they have the same expressions, so it very clear. So in the background with Dakota, if you haven't heard me talk about this, is I had wondered if he was, you know kind of chasing wave ribbons, the white ribbons, if that was gonna be a problem or not. And Sue Sternberg wisely said, she goes, whenever you're wondering if something is a problem or not, she goes, just know it is and stop doing it. Well, she was right. Anyway, this thing got a bit out of hand and he ended up wildly chasing waves until he was a tiny speck at the far end of the beach. 
And he hasn't, he's not had the opportunity to do that again ever since. And it's a bummer because I'd like to go to the beach, but whatever. So today I just, I noticed that, wow, he is like those dogs at trials who are over aroused or they're stressed. I can tell you it is not joy and it's not enthusiasm. It is stress or high arousal. I'm not sure what I would call it. It's not um, it might create drive, but it is not the state that I want my dog to associate working with me or in agility or at the beach. And I didn't even have to go to the beach a whole bunch of times to undo what I got done with him by not recognizing these early, early signs, which were, what is he doing with those waves? And part of it with him I believe there's a slight fear component, the sound. He's a little sound sensitive. So that sound is, makes him nervous. So when you bring these young dogs to their first trials, stay really, really connected and respond to what they're showing you, what they're communicating. Because again, they are gonna notice that you're responding to it and they're gonna feel like you are a safe place to go with this feeling versus they're on their own with it. And if you don't respond to it, they're gonna feel like, oh my God, I'm on my own and they're gonna do what they do. So that's Dakota with the waves. I didn't engage him with me and so he went, you know, a little bit scary but this thing is moving and I'm a border collie and blah, blah, blah. And he took off. And when he came back, he was like, ooh, there was nobody home. And there was nobody home for, I'd say 10 minutes. So let's see, Charlotte saying, Deb, big problems last Friday at trial, too long to discuss here. Where can we talk? Um, you know, we can have a Zoom talk, why don't we? Um, and that's shady, so shady, okay. Well, and you know, talking about dogs not having been trialing, right? Trials are unnatural for dogs, especially when there are dogs that are people are letting stare at the dogs in the ring and be tugging and growling and barking. For the dog in the ring to ignore all that is not natural. That watch dogs at dog parks. Dogs are not, you know, generally disregarding other dogs doing all of that body language and, and vocalization. So, um, Chris is writing Rue and at the trial and rings talking about stress. Yeah, it matters that so much that our dogs know that we are connecting with them when they're experiencing these things and what that connection, what does it look like? You know, it might look like, you know, calling the dog to you, backing away from the thing, you know, going for a brisk walk in the other direction, going back to the car, you know, giving some rubbies, um, realizing that, you know, that you don't even want to get within 30 feet of this ring. That will tell the dog that you are to be trust, trusted, that, that you are not going to be dragging them and making them do stuff that is um, going to put them over the edge. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, right? How, how all of these dogs get used to the trial environment. 